Well, good evening, everyone. I am Supervisor Janice Hahn, and I'm lucky to uh, represent this area on the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors, and really want to thank the PV Art Center for hosting us tonight in this very, very beautiful venue. Thank you uh, for that. Um, and I know uh, I appreciate the elected, uh, and I see Eileen here from our uh, uh, Vanessa Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know a lot of electeds are here. Really appreciate you coming, representing your constituents. Uh, my goal tonight is to make sure we have enough uh, of the community being able to ask questions. And certainly, uh, you're more than welcome uh, to also either submit a card or ask questions. But I'm uh, not going to give you special uh, priority. We so we're all equal here tonight, and I want to make sure the residents all. Uh, get an opportunity to ask their questions. So, you know, when we first decided to all this event, uh, actually it was after having a brief with a, uh, a meeting with Call Sale, and, uh, and some of the concerns I've also heard from the residents, I've heard from my friend Susan Brooks about the recent um, perceived uptick in crime uh, on the hill here, a lot of, uh, of break ins, uh, you know, home uh, burglaries. And that really was my impetus for saying, Sheriff, I want you to come here yourself. Uh, and I want you to talk to the residents. I want you to listen to their concerns. I want you to answer their, their questions. And he is more, uh, was more than willing to do that. Since then, of course, we've had uh, a very dramatic, traumatic incident in Rolling Hills Estates, I mean, and that's with uh, um, the 10 homes that, uh, you know, really collapsed, grumbled, the fell into the ravine behind their home. Uh, we had to evacuate 12 homes uh, there. Uh, two are kind of on the watch list. Uh, they're not sliding yet, but we're, we're paying attention to them. Uh, there, there were some other homes that we had to evacuate because of a, a, a sewer break. So there's been kind of insult to injury that we had uh, a break-in at one of the evacuated homes uh, where uh, like the homeowners up, uh, found their home ransacked. So that's certainly of a concern and, uh, to, to us. So I know there might be some questions about uh, the landslide. Um, and we have our fire department here. We also have the city of uh, Rolling Hills Estates here to answer any questions and give us any updates, maybe about a geologist or weather or um, any, anything we can talk about. But uh, mostly, uh, this was really to answer your questions about, uh, you know, crime, and that's public safety. So it was entitled it a public safety forum. Uh, but public safety kind of takes all sorts of versions uh, out there. Uh, when people don't feel safe, whether it's in their own hall, uh, whether it's because of uh, a land movement, whether it's movements of cry, uh, whether it's incidents on our metro system. When people don't feel safe, then I think it's always valuable to listen to your concerns, your anxiety, and get answers from our top cop, the Sheriff Luna. So thank you for coming tonight. Here's what we're thinking. We put cards down there. So we're thinking if you want to Write just questions on a card. Um, I'll be having my staff uh, pick them up. And my staff here tonight is Jedford is steer, uh, Jenny is steer, a bravery, B. Hallie is steer, Lizzie and Matt are here, uh, Viviana and Luke, my transportation deputies are here, uh, Joel is steer, Ivan is my homeless. Deputy, he's done homeless, but he yeah. he works out those issues for me. And Esteban is here tonight. So all of those are my staff, and they will be walking around. If you have, if you would put your question on a card, sold about they'll have grab it. Or if you choose, when we get to Q and A, just want to raise your hand, somebody can break a microphone to you. And so I was thinking we probably just go back and forth between the submitted cards, and those um, who just want to talk. You know, some people are shy. I know really want to talk to the microphone, so we're going to give them an opportunity. So that's kind of how I think it, it should go tonight. Uh, you know, you can let me know if something is going the way you want it to go, and we'll, we'll make some changes. So I got to tell you, I'm really pleased 
that uh, Robert Ludag is the new sheriff in town in the Los Angeles County. I knew uh, Chief Luna when he was the chief of the Long Beach Police Department. And since I also represent Long Beach, I got to down him at the Long Beach Police Department and I got to know up close and personal how he works, how he treats uh, not only the residents of a particular city, but how he treats his own uh, officers and his own personnel. And I was very pleased to see uh, that he was the LA County voters overwhelmingly elected him to become the sheriff. And you know, it's not everything about how people get along, but it's a lot of how we all work in our own walks of life. It's how you get along. How do you get along with your colleagues? How do you get along with your work colleagues? How do you get along with your neighbors? Uh, and it really improves the quality line for everyone, but we can find ways to work together. I was saying having Sheriff Luna uh, as, as the Sheriff Blas in Los Angeles County, the relationship between him and the five women on the LA County Board of Supervisors is improved tremendously. Um, and we find ourselves spending much more energy working together, much more energy rowing in the same direction to make sure that residents of LA County are safe uh, instead of arguing with each other or name calling each other or second guessing each other. So it has really improved the relationship in the county and I think ultimately it's better for the residents. You don't want to see elect your elected officials fighting. You don't want to see them arguing. You want to see them paying attention to your problems and your concerns. And that's what we have now uh, in, and their C. Derringer showed up. Hi, Pete, thank you for coming. So now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce the new sheriff in town. And you just, uh, you know, say a few words, but you know, since we get to the question and answer, that would be great. But you, I love it when you talk, so talk. Well, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for coming tonight. A uh, good group of people, large amount of people. Uh, and this is what government's all about. Uh, coming out, uh, making sure that the things that we should are supposed to be doing, that we're doing. Uh, and if we're not, uh, we're here to listen. And I'm not going to spend too much time uh, speaking to you up front because I'm really looking forward to listening to your concerns. Uh, I have some pride stats. I have information uh, that was prepared for me in regards to this channel area. But at the end of the day, uh, there's definitely going to be more important than walking away from here with our East staff taking notes about the, uh, all of our neighborhood community concerns here. So again, thank you very much for, for coming here tonight. Looking forward to hearing from you. And Supervisor Ron, I, I want to thank you. You did call me about a week and a half ago and, and asked you to come out. Actually, it was two weeks ago. And uh, so thank you for the invitation. Appreciate it. We hope you still feel that way at the end of the evening. Yeah. So let's take a first question before we get a card. Let's take a question. Hi. Hi. I am a local resident in the community and I am extremely concerned regarding the corruption of our police department, both in Palos Verdes Estates and Lomita Sheriff's Department, and how the KPIs and data are not true, and how we are currently arresting people who are uh, of ethnicities that are not white. If you look around the room, I see a very older age demographic. I live here, I own a home here, I've been discriminated for living here because I am young. I've been targeted by cops because I'm young. My friends have been targeted by cops because they're different ethnicities. And that is the major issue, not crime. Because guess what? Crime in our area is no worse than any LA County area. And the fact that we have a meeting to discuss this because older residents pay lower taxes and then demand more services is the real issue. Thank you uh, for your question. Uh, and I know uh, there's a reaction. Not everyone's got a free in here, but everyone's got to have a right to ask their questions, right? So I want to start off 
by answering that question uh, because I was out not too far from here last night and I ended my statements by saying this. Uh, our deputies and police officers are some of the best in the country. Amazing employees that we have. Uh, for many of you who heard me on the campaign trail, uh, my journey into law enforcement was not an easy one. I uh, grew up at unincorporated East LA and actually grew up uh, wanting to be a deputy sheriff and eventually became a police officer at Long Beach. And a lot of it had to do with the way I felt I was treated as a young Hispanic kid growing up. Um, so uh, looking at both sides of every issue has always been very, very important to me. Uh, I think people always have the right to voice their opinion. And when we have allegations uh, that our officers, deputies are doing something they shouldn't be doing, please, please bring it forward. If you ever get stopped, whether it's a traffic stop or a subject stop and you feel that it wasn't right, uh, we have systems in place, please call us. We want to know. What I find is a lot of people don't call and when you don't call, we don't know. And so it's very important. I, I see, I think the young lady left who batched the question. I was going to uh, challenge her that if uh, she has information about potential misconduct reported to us, we have employees here who are very willing to listen. But again, our employees, 99% of the time, I would challenge anybody to have the most difficult job uh, in the United States, and they do amazing work. But we do make mistakes once in a while. And what we do, you support our deputies. I will hold whoever does help the one accountable. Thank you. Thank you. And I have also to say, all people rock. Uh, so, you know, just a follow on uh, for the tier for all the people. So, you know, kind of following up on that, share th this question said, in recent years, a lot of focus has been placed on see something, say something campaign. What is the process for the sheriff's department to respond to a report of suspicious activity? Maybe no crime has, has been made yet, but something has been seen. If you see something, you absolutely have to say something. Uh, this is how uh, we end up uh, coming across uh, criminal activity. Uh, you are our eyes and ears. It is absolutely critical that if you see something that just doesn't belong, then you call us. The one thing I do ask is that if you get on the phone and either dial 911 or our seven digit line, that when you get on there, you stay on the phone and describe what you're seeing, the exact information so that that dispatcher operator can relay that to our deputies in the field so they can evaluate what kind of call to go to. When the information's exaggerated, sometimes our deputies respond, they respond quickly, and that could get us all in trouble. But it is absolutely critical, and I asked for you, as you walk out of here, we're talking about crime. You are an important piece of that partnership to reduce crime. Thank you. On the 13th of this month, the slide area, we got a call at 621 that two people were burglarizing two of the houses that had been red tagged. That was a see something, say something. Someone saw it on a camera and they gave us a call. On numerous occasions, we've had crimes where people saw something and didn't say something. Now, that happened to me when my house was burglarized up here. My neighbor saw and didn't call. They were outside my house for 19 minutes. So we get this call at 621. The deputies are there three minutes later. They set up a containment, and within a matter of minutes, they'd, app they'd apprehended a male uh, with the help of Torrance PD and their drones. We located a female that was hiding in a palm tree. So we arrested two people, recovered the property from two of those places that had been red tagged. And just so you all know the level of dedication that Crooks put in and stuff, the female that was involved in this crime lived in Hesperia. That's 75 miles from here. So we need you to call. I've been preaching this since I've been at this station. If you see something, say something. You know your neighborhood, you know what's
looks out of place. You know someone walking down the street looks out of place, a car parked in front of your house. It could be your neighbor's long lost relative that you've never seen. You can call us. We would rather come out and investigate that than a who done it, who done it burglary. Because a lot of times that's what we get. Who done it crimes where if somebody saw something and they didn't say something and, and not to steal the sheriff's thunder. It's summertime, folks are going on vacation. We got folks around here that go on dream vacations for two weeks, three weeks, a month, and they don't tell their neighbors that they're going out of town, but they'll post beautiful pictures on Facebook. So you don't want anyone to know your business, post all your business on Facebook, and sometimes an enterprising crook can figure out where you live. So we need your help. We, we this uh, peninsula, top 10 safest communities in California. And we do that with scarcely more than a basketball team every shift. On that, there's someone who said, well, the two individuals recently arrested for the break and be prosecuted, have they been released from custody? So I don't know if that's the information that uh, you can share, but it's a question. I know they were arrested. Are they still in custody? <laughs> it's complicated. They're in, they're in custody, but uh, the female had some, a medical emergency and she went to the hospital and she's currently in the hospital. So she got cited out, but what happens is a warrant goes into the system and she'll be rearrested. The male is still in custody. Hey, thank you. And I, and I, I feel, I appreciate, uh, you know, there's a patrol officer up there, there's a car, it's 24 seven in Rolling Hills Estate. We really appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, this is good worldwide news. Uh, so people are Google mapping this specific homeowners uh, area. They know the house numbers. So it's even more important, Sheriff said, you know, really that the, the, you keep those homes safe because we told them they can't live there. The whole world knows those homes are evacuated. So it's really important uh, that she keeps that up. So here's a, uh, somebody said, I don't feel safe compared to 10 years ago. And I worry about break-ins during the daytime. And I'm afraid of my catalytic converter being stolen, stolen during the night. Um, what's happening? What about property safety? Again, we're here to listen to you. Uh, if you don't feel safe, uh, then we need to uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, and figure out how to work with you uh, to make sure they feel safe. Uh, the reality is, when you look at crime stats, and I'm just going to throw this out, and I'm a firm believer that if you've been victimized, and I showed you crime stats that show their significant reductions, it doesn't matter because your car was stolen, your house was broken into, or something along those lines. From a statistical perspective, uh, it, it shows that we're as safe today as we've been in years. Uh, but there is definitely a perception that, that there is more crime. I understand that, I respect it, and that's the environment that I have to, we have to live in. A lot of that I attribute to social media. Uh, what, what is going on if you're on next store uh, or a lot of these other applications, you know a lot of burglary that occur within it walks. Uh, years ago, we never do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I could tell you that uh, in the old days, somebody from the media would call the front desk and say, hey, what happened last night? Nowadays, uh, the media, our partners in the media are all over it. They're listening to scanners. They're on top of things. They know about everything that's happening and they're reporting it. So that gives people the perception that we're not safe. There's some challenges out there across the board. Our people do this 24 seven uh, up throughout the entire year. Uh, you have to tell us whether things are happening that just like my earlier statement about see something, say something, please do me a favor. If you are the victim of a crime, please report it. I have a lot of people who say they're not gonna do anything anyways. It's not gonna be prosecuted. You hear all these things. My directions to our folks, you respond, you take the report, you investigate, and we do our jobs. 
If somebody else isn't doing their job, they won't bring that to your attention. But we're going to do our jobs, and I need you to call us. Thank you. Okay, we have a question back there. First of all, I want to thank uh, Sheriff Luna and Supervisor Hahn for being here. Um, I want to make a couple of points, and then I'm hoping that I will get responses from both of you. I've been a prosecutor for 30 years for the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. We don't have a perception of increased crime. We have increased crime. I see it every day. It's not a perception. It's not an illusion. It's not statistics. Now, why do we have that? One of the reasons we have that is the district attorney of this county doesn't want to prosecute misdemeanors. He doesn't want to prosecute felonies. He doesn't want to put anybody in custody. He wants to give violent criminals mental health diversion and supervisor Hahn. You yourself supported Proposition J. Proposition J, as you're aware, allocated 10% of the budget to criminal justice matters, excluding additional money for the Sheriff's Department. Now, as you are aware, Supervisor, you didn't have to do that because the Board of Supervisors has control over the budget anyway. And in fact, a court slapped that down and said it was not constitutional. You supported George Gascon. I have not heard you or any of your colleagues other than uh, Ms. Barger in any way criticizing the DA. So here's my question for you, Supervisor Hahn. Do you support the policies of this district attorney? Are you supporting him for re-election? How do you respond to my knowledgeable statements that in fact crime is going up in this county and that we are not properly prosecuting those individuals we have. Sheriff Luna, for you, I've done this a long time. I heard what you just said. What I take that to mean is, and I think it's accurate, they want to cut your budget, they want to curtail what you do, and then they want to blame you when people you arrest, it's catch and release, are back on the street before we can blink. George Gascon supported your candidacy. Are you going to stand up and say, hey, listen, I don't support these policies. They are endangering our community. So I'm hoping that the two of you right now will answer these questions and not duck them. I want to know, who here wants to get answers to these questions? First of all, uh, the voters overwhelmingly did approve what was called Measure J. Uh, the, you know, over 70% of LA County residents want to see us put money into preventing crime in the first place more uh, work uh, with young people, more after-school programs, more job training programs, more things that we can upstream, keep people from coming into our criminal justice system. Uh, nobody wants to see more people uh, coming in our criminal justice system. I don't want to see more people in our LA County jails. They're already overcrowded. Uh, that uh, is that necessarily the solution. Uh, so when voters overwhelmingly said, we think you should take 10% of the county's budget and put it towards activities um, that will really help our young people, will help people start their own businesses. I think I needed the program that the chamber has with young entrepreneurs, getting kids early, um, you know, on a different pathway than a uh, life of crime. The, the, just, it was shot down as being unconstitutional, but the County Board of Supervisors decided to still listen to the will of the voters. The will of the voters said they want more money going into preventive measures. They want more money healthy our young people. They want more money uh, keeping uh, people out of our criminal justice. On the other hand, this Board of Supervisors is very supportive of our sheriff's department. Uh, we have never defunded uh, our sheriff's department at all. In fact, we just finished our budget for this year. Uh, the sheriff's department has more money in their budget than they did last year. We believe very much in supporting our sheriffs and our deputies. And I will tell, I always tell the sheriff this, the only complaint I usually get about sheriff's deputies is there's not enough of them. 
My district loves their sheriff's department. My district wants to see more patrols. Um, and they also want to see us uh, work harder to keep young people from entering our criminal justice system. And as it relates to, to uh, George Gaston, he was elected by the voters. I supported Jackie Lacey. Uh, that was for my first, but why? She was the former DA. She lost. Uh, so you have it wrong on uh, these authority. What do you know? No, I have not uh, supported for his re-election. So that, that is, they're wrong. Two, two, two. Yeah. So uh, I, I support the will of the voters. You know, and if the recall happens, I always support the will of the voters. If they, I think they should elect people. And if they want to recall people, that's their prerogative. And that's this democracy. And I will always support that. All right. What do you have to say for yourself on that question? I have a lot to say. Uh, number one, uh, when I was elected six and a half months ago, I had three and a half weeks to prepare a budget that's $3.9 billion. Uh, it was prioritized based on uh, staffing needs, uh, our settlement agreements, because we have five consent decrees on the LA County Sheriff's Department that I inherited. Maybe get two more here, also inherited. Um, and uh, doing a lot of work from that angle. So the first, one of the first things I did is I looked back as to probably why there had been historically so much conflict between my office and all the five supervisors, including all the county, the other key county uh, offices. So I went out and hired a CFO. Uh, the department didn't have a CFO running the 3.8, 3.9 billion dollar the budget. Uh, we went in uh, and we looked at it very differently. There's a ton of things I want, ton of things I need, but we prioritize based on what we thought we could get. And that $3.9 million budget was approved by the supervisors. Uh, and that was the first time in years that there was, uh, there was a lot of deliberation uh, a lot of debate behind the scenes. There was some on the, on the supervisory floor, but at the end of the day, that budget got approved to provide the services that all of you meet. Uh, as we move forward, do we need more things? Yes. I talk about a 21st century sheriff's department. The systems, the technology are completely adequate. We need a new computer-aided desk dispatch system as if they don't wait in 33 years. We need an EMGO management system, which is one of the causes of why we have so many challenges in court with our custody facilities. Uh, we need an early warning system. We need a new reporting management system. I could go down a long list of things we need. Eventually, we'll get the support there. Uh, in regards to uh, crime, uh, I'm not going to go on the tangent. I'm just going to touch on this. Uh, yes, there are definitely issues uh, with prosecutions. Uh, I don't agree with everything this current DA does. Uh, I do not, have not, and you were mistaken, sir, when you said I supported Gascon or he supported me in my campaign. That's not true. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of the things he does, but I'm not getting involved in that race. I'm not going to get involved in the DA's race. I'm the, the sheriff of Los Angeles County because no matter who gets elected by all of you, my job is to be able to work with no matter what the circumstances are. But one thing I want to touch on that's very, very important because it's as important as any, as any issue surrounding the district attorney's office. Right now, I don't know if most of you know this, but there is a current injunction on Chief Mike Moore from the LA Police Department and myself as your sheriff. The injunction took us back to the emergency bail schedule that was incurred during COVID. So that means that there's a lengthy list of times that people will be eligible for zero bail on. That is this yesterday, today, we're supposed to be back in court on August the 7th, where Chief Moore and I are being asked to testify in front of the judge. The, this case revolves around the constitutional issue of people who can afford or not afford bail. Okay? Uh, we need, we as a community need to pay attention to that issue because if somebody burglarizes your home, there is a chance they're going to be eligible for zero bail. If somebody steals your car, 
they may be eligible for zero bail. If somebody's selling fentanyl, they're going to be eligible for zero bail. That is not acceptable. It's not acceptable and it should be acceptable to any of you. Good evening, Chief, Supervisor. Thank you for making yourselves available. On that specific note, Chief, I have a heartfelt but tough question for you. Um, I am wondering why when Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Riff, that's R-I-F-F, uh, sought out uh, your opinion on bail, sought out Chief Moore's opinion on the very bail issue that uh, you mentioned that your office did not respond uh, in some form of a brief or something of that nature. Is I tend to think of bail as a tool that uh, can be used for public safety and should be used in appropriate circumstances, but from my reading of the opinion, there was no response from uh, you, my sheriff, or Chief Moore, and I did find that disappointing, but I'd like to hear why your office did not respond. Thank you. The county responded. Uh, we're represented by county council, uh, and they represented us just like the city attorney's office represented Chief Moore. You will see us testifying in court uh, on August 7th, if that court date sticks, but it's a legal process. And uh, our attorneys responded on our behalf for both cheating order. Let me go to um, or a lo couple local questions. Um, this one is like the prior sheriff talked about a small basketball team patrolling at the Peninsula. Can we increase the number of sheriffs patrols permanently stationed on the hill? And then uh, we know we have an uh, acting captain, Lieutenant White, Lomita Station. Uh, there's a couple questions about what's the process for uh, getting a permanent uh, captain at Lomita Station. So a little more local. Can we create patrols up here? And what's going on with uh, the acting captain position at Lomita Station? Well, let me take on the first one about the basketball team. <laughs> oh. An all-star team. Yeah, oh, so very thing. We were talking a little bit about the budget uh, without getting into the specific sausage making of it. Uh, in our budget that was approved, uh, we were approved to hire eight deputy classes with the contingency of hiring two additional on top of that. Uh, we just actually, the last uh, board meeting was approved for a marketing firm that's going to assist us uh, with recruiting. Uh, and by the way, this is my plug. If anybody or anybody's family member ever wanted to be a deputy sheriff, we have 1,100 openings. And, and we have another 1,000 openings for professional staff. And we have edited us opportunities of the sheriff's department. So if anybody's interested, we're, please apply. And the board approved money for new academies so we can process people who are coming through and one of these shares. Yeah, those are the eight classes that I'm talking about. Eight classes for this year. I'm hoping I could do at least eight and do the other two because we are hurting. Uh, I'm going to tell you, we do have a crisis uh, in staffing across this county. Uh, I talked about it recently uh, publicly, uh, but we're working very hard uh, to hire people for the back. And actually, there's something else the sheriff's department is doing that we haven't done recently. And that's where we're going out and hiring Black Oaks. Uh, so if there's other uh, qualified members that beat our standards, uh, we're ready to bring them in into our department. And we're also looking at hiring retirees to work on other assignments like court services. So we're really trying to think out of the box on this. Uh, also really focused on employee wellness because you can't talk about recruitment without talking about employee retention. Uh, so we're making a lot of efforts. We just got a $7 billion grant that's going to be focused on this effort. I mentioned it the other day. Uh, I attended a funeral last week. Uh, unfortunately, I hate to report this, but since I've been in office, we've had three deputies commit suicide. Uh, I went to a funeral last week for one of our young deputies. That is not acceptable. When I'm talking about employee wellness, and I said earlier, I talk about what a great department we have. Uh, we need to look at untreated PTSD uh, for misconduct and things of that nature. So that's extremely important. So 
help is coming to be patient with us. It's not going to happen next month or in two or three months, but down the road, there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Almost every one of our contract cities is asking for more deputies. So I really appreciate the fact that you love and respect our employees. In regards to the captain's process, uh, we are going through a series of tests. Now, one thing I did when I became the sheriff that was at Curry in the past, uh, I wanted to make sure that there was a process in place for all ranks. That means there's so the testing process is more extensive. There are more questions that are asked. Uh, so it's taking a little bit more time. You got a patient with us. Uh, we are in the process of putting uh, captains in different stations around the county. Lomita is on our list. The process for the Lomita station should happen in the next two or three weeks. Uh, and as you are probably aware, the community is involved in that process. Uh, so your city officials will definitely have input as to is selected uh, into the station. So a couple of questions about patrol I, again, and and there was one question about and I had one. So what's the personnel number at Lomita Station? What are we talking about? How many? And can you look at to uh, getting more visibility with patrols? So say there's a couple of questions about visibility. So I think people really like to see the black and white. They'd like to see uh, our deputies. Uh, uh, in person, they feel like that not only deters crime, but it's an opportunity uh, to, you know, have more interacts. So maybe the, the number of personnel at Lomita, and then can we talk about more visibility and the troll? I don't like to say how many deputies we put out on patrol because I don't want the bad guys to know. But on average, we we have about 61 deputies at the station right now, and we're down 14. And that's a 24 seven operation. Uh, we'd like to have more. 61, down 14. And that's not counting the number of deputies that we have out injured for various things, injured on duty. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, okay. Sheriff Luna, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, come to this forum. You lead the largest sheriff department in the United States, by the way. Captain White, welcome. My question to you is, where do you find the balance in such a large department between enforcing the law and kindness, understanding, and empathy? I'll be more specific. Homelessness in itself is not a crime, but sometimes the deputies who you lead have to make quick decisions as to what to do with them. So, you know, this is not an easy question, but I'm just wondering how, you know, you ran on the platform of accountability. You said you will hold your deputies accountable, but you also said you will make this sheriff department, one time sheriff department, proud again, because your motto is tradition of service. So I know it's a very general question, but could you share your thoughts, please? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, my, my goal uh, during my campaign, and I really did it again today, was to make sure that uh, I make this the best, not only that it is the largest sheriff's department in the United States, and I'm very proud of me serving as a sheriff, your sheriff, um, but maybe you get the 21st century sheriff's department. Uh, and I'm doing that to just focus on uh, integrity, accountability, as you stated, and collaboration. And that's what we've been talking about. In regards to the combination of enforcing the law uh, and then uh, uh, providing services, being empathetic, uh, I think our employees do a, a really good job in that. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, uh, being a deputy sheriff, a police officer is one of the toughest jobs in the world. Uh, everybody wants you, they, they talk about being a guardian, uh, and we are guardians. We're amazing guardians, but yet if there's a shooting, God forbid, in a school, and there's somebody killing people, they want a warrior to run in there and start immediately saving lives. And we have warriors. 
And it's very difficult to find the right people to be that combination of a guardian and a warrior, but we have them. We have thousands of them in the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, I'm very proud to say. And even though our everyday patrol deputies do an amazing job and we have specialized units, if you're talking about the other house with our host teams or deputies that work our vet, vet evaluation teams or people who focus just on veterans, our team vet teams that work on the Metro uh, to keep that safe and offer services, but at the same time, reducing crime. Uh, I don't know if most of you know this, but you've heard some negativity surrounding the Metro. Uh, I'll proudly say that we have a contract with our partners at Metro. Uh, in the last two months, we were asked to surge the Metro line with 65 additional deputies. It was primarily set into LAPD's jurisdiction of the red line. From the minute we did that, and we did it for a month and a half, we reduced crime on the entire Metro line and we increase the response time. So the three departments between the Los Angeles Police Department, the LA County Sheriff's Department, and the Long Beach Police Department are actually doing a pretty darn good job. Uh, and we're gonna continue to move forward. But I gotta tell you this, as soon as we looked at our employees, and it goes back to your question, and you get, you gotta find that right approach. But the minute the Metro Board said, hey, we're allowing you to enforce the code of conduct again, and enforce the fair evasion. That's when our people went back to work with our partners, ambassadors, and so on. And that's when crime started coming back now. So thank you for your question. I think that's a very uh, similar uh, idea on Metro. People want to see, uh, you know, uniformed officers on the buses, on the train. I think that makes a big difference. You know, but listening to uh, the description of uh, a good, uh, law enforcement person, compassionate, kind, talented, a warrior, uh, a guardian. It's a woman. <laughs> they can get on dead. But seriously, how are we doing on treating women in, in your deferment? Well, thank you for asking that question. Uh, two Saturdays ago, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department had its first with its symposium, where we were focused on recruiting uh, women into the sheriff's department. Uh, when I became sheriff, I signed on to a national pact that said that I wanted to have 30% of our deputies be women by the year 2030. So look it up, 30 by 30, that symposium was a great way of getting us there. And just FYI, uh, on my, what I call my top eight, which is my executive team that runs the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, 50% of the executive staff are women. That's never happened in the executive department. 100% of the county board of supervisors are women. Um, here's one about neighborhood watch. Uh, do you support neighborhood watch programs? How can we create them in our neighborhoods? Yes, yes, yes. That is the key to reducing crime and increasing the quality of life. There is nothing like neighbors collaborating with each other. You know each other's habits. You know who comes and goes. Uh, instead of, I know people are at work. You're on, inside on your computer, watch a television. Get outside to the old-fashioned, get a lock chair, hang out, uh, have a beverage of some kind. And I, I don't have any moderation. Uh, the snacks with each other, get to know each other. Uh, and in regards to make sure you contact uh, your acting captain to be sure how we can help you coordinate meetings in your neighborhood to get people together and to get to know each other. Nothing like a nosy neighbor and a walking dog to freeway correct. I had one uh, specific about uh, 18 Pear Tree Lane in Bainton City. Uh, what would we know that the other town houses on Pear Tree Lane are safe? Uh, and if we are evacuated, is there a chance to pause the mortgage payment? Uh, they just, this is the, my, my well-named friend, Sam White, uh, 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 who just closed uh, on July 1st. So some people just slipped in that. Hi, my name's Alexa Davis. I'm the assistant city manager and um, actively in our emergency operations center, supporting the Pear Tree residents. Um, there's a lot moving, a lot of things happening. And, and you, a movie. 
people. Okay. Okay. Maybe not a good term there. Uh, a lot of, of a very active situation. Um, these individuals we've been connecting with directly, and I think I know exactly who was asking because we had an earlier conversation. Um, you know, we are working with our county partners, and we appreciate you, Supervisor Hahn, um, Sheriff Department for being out on site, and of course our Los Angeles County Fire for being very um, vigilant and aware the day of the event and, and through their emergency. We, um, we don't have an answer on the mortgage question, but we are connecting them to resources directly to help them navigate that question. Um, with the homes, we have 12 red tagged. Um, we don't have an assessment right now until there's a full geology report. The um, additional five yellow tagged, once there is sewer repair, they should be cleared to, to return. We don't have a timeline on that. There's, we need to make sure that the land is stable before any sewer repair can happen. So it's a slow process, but we are actively working with our homeowners and residents um, and, and navigating that with them. And I was proud of our tax assessor, Jeffrey Crane, came out and met with the residents and immediately said, it's clear you no longer have a home uh, to pay property taxes in, in fact, you don't even have your land uh, to pay property taxes on. So he was immediately uh, going to reassess those properties uh, and make sure that they were not stuck with a hefty tax bill come November. Uh, but you're right, mortgage, we, we don't have any control over, over the bank simple, the mortgage. And then just on the land movement, there's somebody that wants to know about what's being done about this. The uh, Seaview Fall Line Vinny Seek Bowl, um, I feel I have heard of a grant that's been applied for. So in my office, uh, Deritza uh, Gonzalez and our Department of Public Works are working on this. Definitely, whoever wrote that question, we can talk to you on the side and get your information so that we can continue to give you an update uh, that our Public Works uh, Department is aware of that and working on that. More than five years ago now, Susan Leeds was violently murdered at the promenade. Uh, her throat cut, stabbed many times. Where do things stand? Are, is the killer still on the loose? That investigation is ongoing, and that's all I can say on that right now. It is ongoing. While we're talking about the mall, did you want to uh, answer these couple questions here about the Peninsula Center, uh, some recent uh, fashion grabs of burglaries? Um, and I know we do have, it does have private security up on tall, but we have been involved and when we actually have sometimes car up there so just when i just speak to the the and it's all uh, concerns okay we've had several commercial burglary we call it commercial burglary at burglaries at ulta and bath and body works at target as well uh, basically that's when a group of individuals drive up there to the mall the peninsula center they go in with shopping bags and they load up with cosmetics or whatever they happen to be stealing in a matter of seconds and they, they, they dash out and jump in a car and drive away. Uh, along with that, we've had several success stories where citizens, once again being vigilant, saw some folks pull up at the Peninsula Center, unload out of a car with shopping bags and thought something was suspicious and they gave us a call. Also, on a couple of occasions, we've had a deputy in the parking lot right when this went down and he or she managed to apprehend them right after the, the crime occurred. Uh, that is a, this is a crime that's not just happening on the peninsula, it's happening all over Southern California and other places. Uh, again, we've had some success stories and some arrests, but these are usually organized rings that are doing this. And all I can ask is that you all are vigilant. If you're outside, out shopping, and you see something suspicious, once again, give us a call. Write down a license plate, take a picture of the license plate, because all that stuff helps us. We have a, a system in place. I don't like to talk about it publicly, but it's a license plate reader system. And it's allowed us to solve a lot of crimes. We can usually see when they, if they have a license plate on their car, when they, when they came on the hill and when they left, what roadway they took to, to leave, and we've had a, a ton of success stories behind that. There's a question about volunteers. Uh, is the Volunteers on the Troll program a valuable, a valuable tool to assist in appropriate roles? And if so, why is there an effort to educate the public about the program and recruitment efforts? The media station has a lot of volunteers. Uh, we'll take more. We can use, we only have a couple of volunteers on patrol. If you'd like to show up and be a volunteer, 
there's probably something we can have you do at the station. If you want to sit in the lobby and greet citizens when they come in, you can do that. If you want to be a volunteer on patrol once you go through the train, you can do that. Basically, you're just our eyes and ears. You don't get involved in anything. You just drive around and look for suspicious behavior. You do vacation checks. That means if some of you are going on some of your dream vacations, you call the station and you ask us to you request a vacation check. Our deputies do vacation checks and our citizens on patrol, our volunteers on patrol do vacation checks. When I first got to the station, we had a lot more and that number has declined in past years, but if you have the time and you want to learn about what we do, you can come down to the station and volunteer. You pass a mild background check, we won't turn you away. So we do not want you to put yourself in Mark's way by any need. That's what they're here for. You, your eyes and ears only, you don't get involved. Okay, then we have a question back there, and I know uh, former mayor works you, you also have a question, so you'll be next after that. Hello, Supervisor. Hello. Hello. This is Jennifer. I live in RPB Eastview, and I was going to ask all other kind of questions about sentencing, but you guys covered that. But on um, the Eastview of RPB, it's the side of RPB that faces the harbor. There's a lot, there's a large homeless population, and there's a lot of, um, Aftermath because of that. For instance, the other morning there was a gentleman with his pants down, asleep in my neighbor's yard. Something um, very disturbing for me to open, to wake up to in the morning. And I noticed here that you guys gave resource guides. How are you guys giving that out to the people who really need them? Well, thank you for that. I know my, uh, Ivan's here, but I do know that uh, certainly all this is probably the largest problem. Uh, that we're facing uh, in Los Angeles County. Uh, the city of LA is also uh, has a new mayor that's 100% laser focused on the encampments uh, and uh, trying to uh, really encampment by encampment find uh, you know another uh, living opportunity for people other than than sleep down the street. Sleeping down the streets is not good for anybody. Uh, it's not a healthy environment, and these encampments are even worse uh, for people. Uh, we do know that drugs uh, are being sold in these encampments. Many women are are, are being uh, you know targeted to live in encampments. So we want to bring people inside, and we do that on a daily basis. Uh, there are numbers that you can call. I would want some good. Are you going to connect with her? Okay, she can get all Ivan. But when we hear somebody who specifically has a person that they see sleeping on the street, um, we go into action uh, and we, we do all we can to uh, reach them where they are. Yeah, it's not a crime. Uh, and it did. I, I, you know, I don't want uh, these people necessarily to be arrested and put in our jails. I don't think that's the place for them. Uh, but they need help. And many of them have mental health issues. And many of them are suffering from serious drug and substance abuse issues. Um, and so we are trying to person by person uh, see if we can remove them from the st streets, remove them from your neighborhood. Uh, but then, of course, try to give them the help that they need uh, to hopefully uh, turn, turn their life around. And that's a lot of what our vet teams are, our mental health evaluation teams. Sometimes people call 911 and law enforcement responds, uh, but we like law enforcement to respond with a mental health professional as well, uh, so that the outcome is really a way to help uh, that person turn their life around. So uh, make sure you uh, call us, call Ivan, if you, if you see someone that needs help. Ms. Brooks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Hahn, for putting this together today. You put this together, and look at how many people showed up. It's a great thing. Uh, and thank you, uh, Sheriff Luna, for coming to our beautiful paradise that we call Palisades Peninsula. And uh, I have been involved in this community for over 38 years in either elected, appointed office, or uh, always working with the public and with the Sheriff's Department closely for many, many years. We have a regional law enforcement committee on the Palisades Peninsula comprised of three cities. Rolling Hills Estates, Rancho Palisades, which I'm a member, and uh, Rolling Hills. We also have Palisades Estates as a separate police department, as you know. 
And then there was a peninsula-wide um, public safety committee that was formed after the murder of Susan Leeds. Well, I was mayor at that time. And we are, yes we are, to the person who was first speaking, we are people, we are older, many of us, but we care about our community. We care about our children, our schools, our safety. And we pay more money to live here, even if there are a few slides now and then. So my question is, we, uh, we have always had stalwart, really wonderful support from the Sheriff's Department. And I've served with five different captains. And it's been really a very strong unity with all, all my fellow former, my, uh, former council members, <laughs> the current ones. They know that it is very important to have a strong relationship with your captain. And Jim Powers was the captain, and he left in, uh, in December, I believe it was. So we don't have an active captain now. And that does have an effect on the community, because we have been known, sometimes people will say, we are the lazy city, because we don't have a lot of action. And some people like to go where there's action. But we really need to know when there is action, somebody's going to be there. And it has been somewhat lackadaisical, I would say, uh, since January. And it would be important for us to know that the response times are going to be commensurate with the distance. And that people are not being somehow perhaps redeployed to other areas in order to compensate for needs that may be uh, met elsewhere. These are important issues for us. We pay, what, $8 million, is it, right now, for our sheriff's contract. That's our biggest contract. It's a big deal. We need to know that our black and whites are here for us. We need to know that we're going to have, hindsight's 2020, but when we look at those 10 houses, why didn't we have somebody stationed there when the issue happened? It was invitation time. So, this is, and now it's not necessarily our responsibility to maintain that, because that's, that would be the homeowners association, I think. But the, the fact is that we need to have that insight, you know, that backbone. And I would urge you to look at that, and also to reconsider the volunteers on patrol. When we had the ALPRs issued in 2015, we had so many volunteers on patrol in the white cars with the yellow symbols. And yes, it may be more difficult, Mike, to get them now, but that doesn't mean that we can't get them. And they're not, you know, they wouldn't be paid employees, but I know that there are volunteers over there working at the office. So it's really important for you to continue and be the wonderful leader you are and work with our community. Was there a question? No, it's a statement. Okay. It was that side. When they got launchers for because we did what? It's such a long yes on this roll. Uh, and some of the other issues. So. It, no, you did a great job. Okay, okay. I can mean, ask why I'm sure. The ALPR background too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your thanks for your dedication to the art community. Good evening, Larry Mazelish. I live here in the city of RPV. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Hahn and Sheriff Luna for your time here tonight. Uh, effective law enforcement really requires efforts both on part of the law enforcement agency and efforts from the residents uh, as well. And this is in the nature of relationships. So what is the Sheriff's Department doing to improve the more personal level relationships between uh, the local station and the residents of the community they serve? Uh, as well as what do you want us residents to do to build up that relationship? When there is some type of relationship, it seems that we're always more vigilant, we're always more willing to uh, see something, say something, call it in, uh, because we don't feel like we're inconveniencing the deputies. We just feel like we're uh, a member of the team, so we have that more of a team approach. So uh, if you could offer a few thoughts on that, please. First, can you come and make the commercial for us? I'd be happy to. I'm a voiceover artist. Uh, you have my number. We're going to take someone who grab us now. 
we're gonna we're gonna use him. You get the nail on the head. Uh, again, you don't have safe communities. You don't have good quality of life if you don't have those relationships. Uh, the standard for me coming in really across the department, not just our patrol stations, patrol divisions, patrol stations, uh, is that they, it's that option. You will figure out a way uh, to communicate with your residents uh, and make them part of the solution. So there should be sessions uh, that that captain in that area puts together and there are more listening sessions to make sure uh, that we're on the same page. Uh, that's again, that's not optimal. That's the absolute way uh, it has to be. If we're not seeing that here, you gotta let us know. Uh, and, and that that's the goal at the end of the day. You know, uh, we were talking about uh, substance abuse as it relates to all us earlier, but someone uh, has said they have two granny subs at the two high schools. Uh, they tell us that they can't even get into the boys' restroom without being uh, offered drugs. Uh, is there a plan to help solve this major problem among our daddy people? We'd like to talk to you after this fee, uh, because if you have specific information like that, uh, that is 100% unacceptable. Uh, drugs being sold anywhere are not acceptable. We are talking about a, the school rounds, I don't know what age of the children we're talking about. Uh, you got to get that information to us so we can start working on that. Obviously, it's summertime. I don't know if there's summer school. But if that was going on during the year, please let us know. Uh, unfortunately, uh, thank God, I, not in this community, but in others, we have had uh, significant challenges. And uh, I'm going to tell you something, because uh, this doesn't come out that this month that much. But if you look at the overdoses uh, in the county of Los Angeles, uh, specifically for methamphetamine and fentanyl, they're outrageous. They're outrageous. And uh, just so you're aware, we did a press conference on this several months ago uh, where I, I spoke with partners from the DEA, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and several other uh, federal, state, and mobile agencies. When we get an overdose in the old days, uh, we would call the paramedics. They would take the patient away, and that was almost the end of it. There was a report filed. Nowadays... We have a specialized unit within our narcotics bureau, and they start backtracking that information. So if we get somebody uh, and we get connect the dots, uh, our detectives will file significant charges on somebody who is selling that poison out on the street. Because at the end of the day, that's exactly what it is. Uh, we will attempt to get those uh, charges filed uh, either through the DA's office, and if it doesn't work there, uh, we have been successful with the U.S. Attorney's Office. That's why I had a press conference with them. So just be aware that those efforts are out there, but there is a lot of work to do. Uh, it would take me an hour to talk about where we're at as a community, as a society with drugs and the acceptance of drugs. Uh, we have a very serious drug problem in this country, and we need to do something about it. And continuing to legalize thing after thing uh, isn't helping, and I don't think it's sending the right message to our children. My personal opinion. Thank you. First of all, as a lifelong resident of LA County, and somebody that worked alongside both the Sheriff's Department I can tell you we are very fortunate to have both L.A. County Sheriff's Department and the Fire Department working for us. So thank you for that. The, the recent tragedy that we experienced over on Pear Tree Lane reminds us that we at Rancho Palos Verdes are dealing with our own landslide issue. Now our city officials have been diligently working on a plan to help try to mitigate this. But we're going to need assistance that. So I have two questions regarding that. The first is for supervisor help. Is it, as you're well aware of the problem, are you doing everything possible to lobby for us, both at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level, to assist us with this problem before the worst case scenario happens? And if it does, if Alice Marie's drive south should fail, it would have an incredible effect across the entire 
Thanks. And two, for Sheriff Hood, thank you for being here. Perhaps even more so far in the county fire department. Are we updating our emergency action plans? And are we prepared for this worst case scenario? Because that would severely hamper emergency rescue efforts if that should happen. And I know that's probably an impossible question, but it's something that we have to address before the worst case. Did you guys put them up to that? Right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, you need to know that your city officials are on this. And every time your mayor sees me, she asks for money uh, for this particular thing. I don't care if we're uh, at a social event, if we're uh, unveiling the, the helipad with the, with the fire department, or we serve together on the sanitation department. She always brings this up. I understand it's about a $30 million uh, project. Uh, give or take, and, and uh, the city maybe has secured maybe $22 million, and so you're looking for that final uh, amount of money. Absolutely, uh, I, I will help. Uh, just talk to Funders member Ted Lou about it yesterday. Uh, we got it on his radar. We're going to get the help from the city, from the county, uh, from the state, uh, from the federal government, of course, because the, I think, um, you know, that's what everybody wants. It's like we know the land is moving. And I think what happened at the hair tree just made it more evident that if we know uh, the land is moving and if we know that there are measures we can't take now to mitigate it and prevent a major disaster, of course we're going to. Um, and you can attest to this, Barbara, but at the last L.A. County Sanitation meeting, I also brought it up because it's in the L.A. County Sanitation's interest uh, that that land doesn't move. That's a major uh, sewer line uh, that, that runs along there. Uh, and uh, if that were to uh, move or crack, you know, freak me up Shiv's Creek, literally in book. Uh, so I asked for uh, the sanitation department to also look to see if they have funds because, again, it's in everybody's interest that we now uh, do this. I appreciate uh, Rachel's House Hurdy City Council looking at this, coming up with a plan, and absolutely you would count on me uh, to, to help, you know, close that funding gap so that we could do that project. Yes. Hi, Supervisor and Sheriff Nina. Um, I want to first thank you for this town hall because I think this is a wonderful opportunity to have the government come to us, which is amazing. Uh, I'm the president of the Homes Association for Academy Hill, and I can say from personal experience, I'm a volunteer at the Lamita Station, and it's wonderful. I have had nothing but wonderful experiences with the officers there, and whenever our community has had an issue, they come right away. Same with fire. Whenever we needed them, they come right away. And the staff at your office, Supervisor Han, amazing. Whenever we need something, a connection for public works, honestly, I, I'm very happy with the response that I've gotten from all three. Um, I have two questions, and one is for Sheriff Luna, and the other one is, is for Supervisor Han. Uh, Sheriff Luna, you mentioned about the injunction in reference to the no bail and that we should be paying attention to it. I'd love to do that, and I think more residents would like to do that. Do you have any suggestions for us on what we can do to help you do your job and, and be able to conduct your investigations and not release people without knowing if they are going to be a risk to our communities or not? And for um, Supervisor Han, I, I've asked a couple months ago, and I have been speaking with someone from the Community Liaison Department for Fire. I asked for a community, community evacuation drill. And I asked for that because, and I'm sure other communities that are represented here have similar uh, elements in their community that they would want to see a community evacuation drill happen. But specifically for our community, we have Chatham School at the top. We have only one entry and egress point to our community. And without any special events happening at the school, there are always about a thousand individuals up at the school that only has one narrow entrance. And about 182 homes with, let's say, an average of two people. So that's about 1,400 people that 
in the case of a fire, a shooting, a big event, even like this land movement that we just experienced. I mean, we have some homes that are up against the canyon, so it's not like totally impossible. So I would love your help in creating a timeline. I know in Malibu, apparently the Office of, of Emergency Management has done virtual community drills, and I think it's very helpful to bring the community together and have a plan. Uh, thank you for the question. And your question, kind of the gentleman in the back had asked this, and um, I'm very proud. We have our emergency operations bureau first about these are professionals that travel all over the country. And I don't need to tell anybody here, uh, when you do either law enforcement or fire or emergency preparedness in the county of Los Angeles, you have to be ready for fires, floods, landslides, riots. I could go just down a long list and we have amazing relationships uh, with other county partners, uh, access to mutual aid uh, up and down this not only region, but state. Um, so uh, I am uh, very confident that they would be prepared to respond to any emergency, uh, uh, not only in this county, but we're often summoned to help other uh, jurisdictions around the world, as a matter of fact, because of our expertise. Uh, our police and fire work together, incident management teams, and collectively that those leadership teams uh, are based. Uh, so that's great. In regards to the, the bail issue, I'm going to spell out the name of this case because uh, it, it has a, an interesting spelling. Uh, it's like Oquati, and that spell U R Q U D I. That's the name of the plaintiff, and it's versus the county of Los Angeles and the city of Los Angeles. Uh, you can follow that case. But I'm happy to report in the last contract cities, meeting I met city managers for all over the county, reaching out uh, to make sure they get fully engaged uh, and have some type of intuit. So I know, and the supervisor can attest to this, I know she got several calls from our contract city partners about what the heck is going on with this case. Um, so uh, please follow it. Uh, make sure you are contacting your local city government officials because uh, Contract Cities is fully engaged with us on this uh, effort. And and this this question kind of, or it's not really a question, it's kind of a clarification by somebody. It says, just to clarify, no bail on does not mean the suspect is just released. A judge, uh, bail fiduciary, has to make an individual by taste determination that the suspect will be held in custody versus being released uh, depending on their public risk and breadth. So just when you hear the schedule that certain uh, crimes will be no bail, and it goes back to just the, the equity, the quality idea that you shouldn't, uh, those that, because, you know, currently do you have enough flooding, you can get out of you, you can pay the bail and get out. Uh, but it speaks to those who uh, don't necessarily have that money. Shouldn't they be remain in jail versus the wealthy who can pay to get out? And kind of goes back to that. But ultimately, even though this three schedule will say certain crimes are no bail, it is still unto the judge uh, in that particular case to weigh whether or not uh, it's a risk to the public before um, their relief for, 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 for clarification, uh, that's you're talking after they get a raid. We're talking about uh, the minute that they get arrested uh, and they go into custody. Uh, that's when that goes to LA. And unfortunately, uh, there are people being released yeah. before they go to court. And I know there's got to be a balance in this. Yeah. We need to pay attention. Yeah, I need you're right. to find print. You're right. Okay, I think Kelly Hathor and should go to Jennifer. Good evening, my name is Jim Amarino, 26 year veteran in LAPD. After that, 14 years in the Orange County Sheriff's as a spokesman. I want to commend the Sheriff's Department as a 40 year veteran. I've lived in Long Peninsula for 40 years. And what does bother me is there is a lot of fear in the community. And this deputy DA stole my lines, and there's no question 
it is because of the soft attitude of the LA County District Attorney. People are being released, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sheriff, two or three times. They can be arrested, and they're out before the police officers finish their paperwork, come out and commit another crime. Breaking into someone's home, in my opinion, is a violent crime. Selling fentanyl, we are losing thousands and thousands of young lives because of these drug dealers. Now we're proposing no bail on fentanyl. Do you think they're going to go to Prop J? All propositions are written by professional writers to make them sound, it's my opinion, to make them sound better than they are. In theory, diversion, no jail, is a good idea. I'm all for that. I've worked many programs. With practicality, it doesn't work. I don't know. I think there should be studies to see if it works. I think when I ask people, hey, let's go out to dinner, I don't go out at nighttime anymore. Why? Because I'm afraid. What else would people think when they turn the news on every morning and you see killings every single day in downtown LA? I'm not exaggerating, turn them off. You see violent crashes on the freeway every night, every day, because no, there's no consequences. We need a district attorney. You have a, dis a former district attorney sitting in this room that prosecuted people that needed to be prosecuted. We don't have the DA here. Can we do this thing? We don't have the DA here making that claim. Yeah, would you like? Is there any questions? You don't have the current DA here. The sheriff, too. The sheriff, I'm just saying, I was in the sheriff's department. I commend you what you did the other day on the news with the video transparency. I think the sheriff's in the right direction. I think you have a great department. I think you're a great sheriff, in my opinion. I just think the law. I think all my citizens deserve better. Correct. I've known that guys. I've known Jimmy Alamino for 30 years. Thank you, Jimmy, for your service with LAPD, Orange County Sheriff's. And it was very interesting to hear you say you're a trained observer. So you notice things like that. And to be honest with you, I think that's part of uh, Neighborhood Watch or uh, that's what, to see something say something you want us to be a little more observant. Uh, we should all be trained observers so that what we can recognize things. Joey, comment on, wasn't really a question. <laughs> I appreciate your service. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joe Collins. I own an uh, auto repossession company for approximately 25 years. I have something to vote for you, but also I have a new show. A lot different now than it was 25 years ago, especially in my time. I you think your department has always been outstanding. But your tow yards are not. For instance, when they impound the car, 
and your tow service is going to allow for certain towing out to come and pick that car up. For the most part, they cheat the consumers on money. And so I can say this because I'm a subject matter expert. I'm a lobbyist. I passed laws in Sacramento for, I don't know, 15 years for release, for release procedures in the vehicle code. I know when I go to a tow yard, I know what I'm looking at. Everybody else in here is what we would consider the least sophisticated consumer. They have no idea. They pay what they're supposed to pay. Your tow yards are cheating. Now, I can tell you why they cheat. On your vehicle release, it says, okay, give this car to the bearer of this notice. And then it has one line that says, this is not a directive to release the car to anyone. It's up to your discretion. And that is incorrect. The vehicle code says exactly who gets the car, when, and how it's done. Now, it's not your fault. This is a problem for you either. The question for you is if you would like, I can help you fix the problem in your tow network so that your consumers will not be getting cheated. It's a matter of time before a consumer protection attorney is catch up with you and start suing the county for something that can be pro prohibited. Always accepting help. I could have a staff member after the speedy get your information so we get more information to figure out exactly. We don't really have one Toby or the guy that's county we had does it. I basically have to get out receipts from somebody and I can show you exactly how they do it. You can fix that problem. Thank you. Thank you. Now, supervisor Hahn, I couldn't make you out. Right. I've never had my tow told my cards up. <laughs> my yard has been broken into. 15 times. Catalytic converters gone. Tow trucks stolen. I caught a person one time walking down the street wheeling a wagon full of stuff from my yard. I held him there, called the police. He got three, four thousand dollars worth of stuff. He admitted he stole it from my yard. The case was never filed. The problem that we have today is not the criminal element, so much as law enforcement is handcuffed. No doubt in my mind, you turn the sheriff's department loose, there won't be anybody left to be caught. But that's not what we're doing. What we have decided was we downgrade property crimes. And so, that's self explanatory why the people drove 75 miles to come to this area because there's no punishment. You'd be lucky to get the case filed. And I get break-ins constantly if we catch them. Do we can't even get Do you want to say where your uh, yard is? It's in the unincorporated part of the county. Where? Rose Grand and the 110 freeway. Okay. Okay, so the problem that we're running into here is there's no prosecution for property crimes. Now, I can tell you what they do prosecute. They will prosecute if you do something back to the person who stole your stuff. That person will get prosecuted. I hear you. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there was a lot of concern. We can't tell me. And there was a lot of feeling that there is definitely a connection uh, between property crimes and maybe, uh, a, you know, a lack of uh, prosecution. You know, I'm certainly going to bring a lot of your concerns back to the DA. I mean, we're sure. But what you have to remember is, every time I ask, why was this a DA reject? I'm told just to file an insurance claim. Okay, it hurts small business, but pretty soon you'll have more people in here being victimized just like I am. I hear you. And to speak to the Catalan converter, I think there's awful some questions about that. And I do think we'll be the station that's going to have, am I correct, in a Catalan converter at chain uh, from right? That's one of the things we're trying to do is get to take the time uh, to bring your, your car in. We will enter it with an uh, ID number so that, in fact, the it is stolen, you know, we can trace it a little bit better. I know we'd like to prevent the crime in the first place, but I think that's a service uh, that you're offering. Is that correct? The problem with etching those catalytic converters, you're talking to a guy that's repossessing. Okay, the problem with that is he scratched the numbers off. All right, now let me... Like, the minerals out of the inside they sell new. Thank you. Well, I did that. Let's just let's just see from uh, uh, Lieutenant White. Is that are, is that something that we're trying to do to help? There'll be a cabinet and converter hitching event at Rancho Palos Verde City Hall on the 29th of July. Starts at 9 o'clock. It's from 9 a.m. to 1 1 p.m. And what can people hope to 
that she, or is there a peace of mind that you get when you are, are you ram your kind of letting liver etched? On numerous occasions, some of our deputies have stopped cars and made arrests uh, suspects that had multiple catalytic converters in their cars. They have no identifying marks so, we can, so that we can trace them back to the owner or the victims of those steps. So if by chance we should make an arrest and someone has a catalytic converter with an identifiable number that they had etched in it, we can locate a victim and start the, the prosecution proceedings. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to someone else, sir. That's okay. Uh, but as the sheriff has also uh, offered to meet with you afterwards, uh, to see if you can uh, help solve some problems. Yes, Jennifer. Hello, my name is Maureen. Um, I'm from Long Beach. I'm a special education teacher and spe um, school counselor for 19 years. My um, question to you is, do you think the fact that Los Angeles is a sanctuary city is contributing to the homelessness? Um, I know I believe it became a sanctuary city in 2019. Um, I have seen the homelessness increase um, all throughout Los Angeles. I am a part of a group called Make Los Angeles Gold Again. I have done cleanups uh, with Sheriff Bill and Away with permission with different groups. I really care deeply about my uh, city and um, county. I was born here. And mm -hmm. I believe I've seen other states. I've driven through many states, such as Florida, and I do not see homeless encampments all throughout their state. So I, I know that the city council in 2019 put out a resolution to go ahead and declare uh, Los Angeles a sanctuary city. To me, that's the root cause of the problem. If we were not a sanctuary city, we didn't encourage helplessness and um, people to not, you know, support themselves, maybe we would um, do better here. Thank you. Can you go ahead and uh, give your thoughts on that? Um, Sheriff White and, um, Sorry, yeah, Deputy White and Sheriff Luna. So um, let me just speak to that. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, on the city council of uh, the city of Los Angeles at this point. I am a county supervisor. Um, I will say that there are so many great causes of homelessness. Uh, we know now that it is not one size fits all for those who have fallen in the illnesses. We know over 30% have serious drug and mental health issues. We know many of them are women who are seeing a domestic violence situation um, and are needing their homes for that reason. We know many people, uh, the, the economics of their lives, uh, the economics of uh, where we live, you all talked about how expensive it is to, to live here. A lot of people, honestly, uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, priced out of where they live. So we have lots of reasons for people that are homeless. Uh, the number uh, is growing. More people are falling into homelessness. Uh, we know that the three-year pandemic wrecked havoc in so many people's lives. Many people lost their jobs. Many people who worked for something, a restaurant, a business, they never came back. A lot of businesses did not survive that pandemic uh, and did not come back. So people lost their jobs. So we have a lot of reasons for all of this, uh, but we know uh, that you are expecting uh, those who are in office to solve that problem. Um, and it's true, we need to build more housing. Uh, we are working very hard to get people off the streets and into temporary housing. We have people who are working case by case uh, to help people find a new pathway in life. Uh, Care for will be coming online because one of the issues, as you all know, is some people have severe mental illness and mental health challenges. And so far, we've not been able to reach that. Any family members, by the way, I mean, you think all these people on the streets are, don't have families? Many of them have families, and the families just don't know what to do anymore. The families are at the end of their rope. Uh, they told me I kicked them out. I couldn't deal with them anymore. Uh, so Care Court will be coming online in December where a loved one, a family member, can uh, petition the court to take a look at their 
family member who has severe fatal illness, is living on the streets, can't take care of themselves, and they will be sentenced to care. And they will be given a uh, program of care management. Maybe that's taking medication. Maybe that's living some, somewhere under supervision. Uh, so we think that might be one of the missing pieces for people on the streets. And I'm hopeful that that will be uh, successful. I went to that encampment uh, in Lomita, uh, and I met a woman who, if I didn't know better, she was like, she was like me. I mean, she recognized me not because I'm Gianna's home, but she recognized me when she remembers eating at Sushi Tashiro, my favorite sushi restaurant in San Pedro. She's like, I used to eat there, you know, three times a week. She was one class away from completing her master's at Pepperdine. I mean, my whole family went to Pepperdine. That's what we all graduated from. And her mother lived uh, in San Pedro, and her mother feels helpless to you know what to do with her. She does not want to come to inside. And so I spent time talking to her. We have mental health professionals talking to her, and something in her just caused her to not want to be a part of society anymore. And I'm telling you, that happens everywhere. Uh, and does it necessarily have anything to do with a city's stature? Yes. Um, hi, Deringer. And I want to ask a question um, that relates to something that uh, the Peninsula Cities put a letter out because there was a recommendation from the Civilian Oversight Commission and it was dealing with deputy gangs and so forth. But one of those recommendations was that there would be mandatory rotation of deputies at all at all stations. And as a full-time DA veteran uh, in Compton, I realized there is a need if somebody's involved in a deputy gang, one of the provisions could be to transfer that deputy of those deputies that are involved. But to do that and rotate people like deputies who are in Lomita Station, many of whom have formed relationships with our community members, where they understand our community, they, they on first name basis with members of our community, that would be a hardship. So I know he sent a letter to the supervisor and also to the sheriff to let us him know of our concerns that that would really um, put a big detriment on the quality of policing in our community because we rely on those relationships um, that have been forged, our core deputies that work with the community. So what, has there been any movement on that to give uh, some kind of change on that one recommendation to ratchet that back and not make it automatic? So I'm gonna start off on that one. Uh, the issue of deputy gang is a very serious one. Uh, we started our Office of Constitutional Policing just to, to deal with settlement agreements and the issue of deputy gangs. The 27 Civilian Oversight Commission recommendations, they're really good recommendations. We've already started working on several. Uh, there's others that, that they're a work in progress. Uh, the specific recommendation about rotations uh, is something that multiple, I, I, I don't know if I've gotten letters on it on one topic like I have on that issue of the contract cities, don't you dare move deputies. Uh, I'm not ignoring any of those. That is something we're gonna have to reconcile with the CLC that I can't ignore my customers and that's our contract cities. So uh, we're gonna have to go back to the Delaine Ward. I, I know why they recommended that. There's a lot of uh, data uh, analysis that was done as to why. I don't know if that's the most affected way. And I think there's definitely some kind of a compromised we can reach to make sure all sides are gonna be somewhat, not completely happy, but satisfied. I appreciate you saying that because yeah, we've heard from a lot of people because relationships is what we're talking about. So, uh, you wanna know your deputies, you want them to know you. Uh, you know, it's the only, I know sheriffs don't like to hear a senior lead officers sent an LAPD thing, but that's the concept, right? And have met deputies who know your community, they know your neighborhoods, they know where there's problems, they know where there's traffic issues around a school. So I, I there is a balance and I, I'm, I'm glad you said that. One of the things I just thought about, I didn't, we didn't really answer your question about the evacuation. Uh, there was a question about Chadwick and Chadmi Hill. 
Uh, and I don't know if Chief Bennett, if you wanted to weigh in on what would be the best way to organize some uh, evacuation drills uh, for our community. I will tell you, eat on the pear tree that night when uh, we gave them like 20 minutes, some of them less than 20 minutes to get their things and get out. It was a very traumatic, shocking experience. It was clear they weren't really prepared uh, to uh, evacuate that quickly. And I know there's some things that we all should be thinking about in case uh, of an event like that. But I, I do want to see, uh, yeah, that, that uh, is there a way that we could begin to organize neighborhoods, schools, uh, to do some evacuation drills, whether it's an active shooter, God forbid, or a uh, sudden natural disaster? Because I think that's a really good question. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I, I'm the one who should have jumped on that question earlier. Yeah. Uh, Evacuation-wise, the sheriff's department is in charge of evacuations. We work with our partners at LA County Fire. They're awesome. He can add any information we want, but... Let me figure that out through your city officials, through the supervisor's office on how we can coordinate uh, some drills. Uh, we've done this before at Malibu Lost Hills because obviously they're no stranger to the evacuation due to fire. Uh, and we've been, we learned lessons, but we've been very successful as well. Uh, so we could definitely uh, work with you to coordinate something. Chief, do you want to add anything tonight? I know uh, you get to stand on her side. I just always want to give another big, huge shout out to LA County Fire Department. They have found us it. That I that I knew they were out there and getting people less than 20 minutes to get their stuff. At one point, they said, "I don't feel comfortable with you going in, but if you'll tell us where that thing is, we will go in and get it for you." As these homes were clearly moving. Uh, they were retrieving things that the residents uh, could tell them about. It was really uh, quite amazing. I, I really want to thank you for its compassion. The compassion. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor and, and Sheriff. Specifically to your question, I've spoken to our uh, community service liaison. And while it is a, it's a group effort between ourselves and the Sheriff, we'll uh, reach out to you. We have a sidebar tonight, and we'll have our local come up and just assist you with that uh, chat. Supervisor, thank you too for that. It's been a long week and even longer for the residents up there in Bear Tree. But just to let you know, uh, we're here for you guys. We're here, we're there every day. We're preparing for response into that area. We're going to assist uh, the City of Rolling Hills Estates with kind of a long term and a long haul you guys got in front of you. So uh, hang in there. We're there to be with you. And remember, on evacuation, we have Know Your Zone and the PDP Day. So everybody make sure to, to know that into those uh, websites. And you can assist us by being ready. Thank you. There's a couple of questions about traffic and speeding, uh, particularly as, it, as it's uh, around some of the schools. Did you want to speak to uh, traffic uh, control? Okay. You all live around here. You know what's going on. You see someone's cars are speeding on a particular street, Silver Spur, Hawthorne, Crenshaw, PB Drive, West. Call the station and ask for the watch commander. Same thing when you see something, say something. I won't stand here and tell you that occasionally we don't drop the ball. We do. The deputies on this peninsula do an outstanding job, but occasionally we fall short, and we don't know everything. You all are out here 24-7, and if you want to report something and you call the station, and you don't get the... We have to remember, sometimes when people call the station, it's their first time interacting with law enforcement. They might be a little nervous. They might not know exactly what to say. But if you call a station and you don't get the response that you think you deserve, ask for the watch commander. Okay? And if that doesn't work, you can call them another day or that day, ask for me. I'll call you back. Leave a message, I will call you back. But school's out right now, but people still speed 24 7. If there's a particular street, call the station and report it, and we'll see if we can get some enforcement. PV Drive East is a always. The switchbacks is an always. Crenshaw. Hawthorne Boulevard is kind of an always. Silver Spur. You can even report these youngsters that are riding these e bikes. They're going way too fast. You want to know about that too. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank Supervisor Jonas Fond for inviting me here tonight and also for Sheriff Ron 
Robert Yuna being here. Um, I am maybe one of the unspoken cases that you don't always see as supervisor Khan has mentioned. I felt short during the pandemic. I was homeless. And you may not know it looking at me, but yes. And I didn't know what I signed up to live the affordable housing at Fairview Bites. I was actually signing not only my dignity away, but also my soul. I've been abused in this building, not only by residents, but also by Lake House of staff. I've been trying for so long now to get help. I've been there since March 31st of 2022. My apartment has been broken it too. My property has been vandalized. At 923 East Redondo Boulevard, although it is not in this district, I appreciate you allowing me to come tonight because in the district where I am, Holly Mitchell, they have not been able to respond to me. So I really appreciate it. I would have been here sooner, my apologies, but my car was vandalized to the point it wasn't running. And then the building had it towed. So I took two buses, two trains to get here. And I would ask if there's any harm at all. I would love it. I can't get my car out now. Now I know of a car. I don't have my property. And I'm being severely abused where I live and my life is surrendered constantly by the residents and also the staff. So I just wanted to follow up with what you said that some of the things get someone like myself that just really needs some help. Thank you so much and God bless you both. Thank you for all the service that everyone does and the Los Angeles Fire Department Hands all to you. And I'll, I don't want for you to come over here and, and talk to Ivan. Uh, and, and you know what? We do help districts in the, in the county, but you know, we all help each other. We all help each other. Uh, I've been given referrals by other supervisors, and we do the same. We're going to see what we can do to help you. Thank you. Okay, I uh, just want to say a comment really quick for the residents here. A lot of people complain. We heard that young lady about some officers pull people over and then they say, they question them. That's the officer's job. The officer to be vigilant, to protect all of you. That is his job. We should be thankful every day that every officer leaves his house every morning, he might not even return home. For us, to protect us and our family. Please appreciate this department. It's the best department in the country. Please give it a strong round of applause to the sheriff and the sheriff department. Good evening, Theo. So the Sarah Rouse invaded. We thank here for Sheriff another round of more blood on with Frank Lee, the communist and that analyst, and Leanne Free. It's questions. Thank you for what you're doing everything to protect and serve 10 million residents of Los Angeles County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, one of the things that I kind of got out of this meeting was that they're pretty happy with the sheriff, in, uh, you know, our sheriff in general. Um, we have an acting captain right now, and hopefully we'll have a permanent captain soon. But our, our goal has been to have people be more involved and um, to get to know their deputies. And we have that to a certain extent. I've been at many homeowners meetings where deputy sheriffs have just stopped by. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's an ice cream social, which of course the deputies like, but the, the homeowners meetings, they come to the homeowners meeting, they come to the council meetings, and they're very responsive if we call up. And I hope that um, we could encourage our residents to keep in touch, to also let them know if we go on a vacation, because they will check a couple of extra times in the neighborhood. And the most important thing that our acting captain, Michael White, has been trying to drill into the community 
is that if you see something, say something. And I'm probably as guilty as the next person. Um, oh, well, I didn't want to call, but I actually saw a guy with a mask on, and, you know, on a really hot day. And I thought, what on earth? Did I call? No, but I should have, and I will if it ever, if I ever see that guy again. So, you know, it's all our responsibility. They have not enough deputies right now. They're looking for people that are interested in a career in law enforcement. And I would hope that if any of our young people are interested at all, that they um, get in touch and apply and Maybe they want to go to college and take a, a career in criminal justice. But, you know, people have to be involved in, the, in their own responsibilities for their own homes and neighborhoods. And so if you see something, say something. So I would say uh, both of us being on the Emergency Preparedness Committee, um, what we saw tonight was the collaboration between the LA County Supervisor's Office and the LA County Sheriff's and working together. We may not agree with them on everything, but at least it is not dysfunctional anymore and they're actually collaborating together. So that I think is going to help public safety across the peninsula and across Los Angeles County. So I love the fact that they're collaborating, they're speaking together, because a year ago, you would have never seen one of the sitting county supervisors on the same stage with the LA County Sheriff. So I think we're in such a, a much better place today than we were a year ago. Yeah, my colleague said it. I think the collaboration is key. It was underscored today. I really appreciate Sheriff Luna in particular for the air and culture that he's bringing to the LA County Sheriff's Department. In addition to that, uh, community policing really is about all of us, right? So one of the one of the topics tonight I know is about educating the public and see something, say something. I know we say that often. However, you heard the emphasis tonight, I think, from our professionals here, LA County Fire, as well as our Sheriff's Department, requesting that as residents we take part in our own public safety. So I think that's the secondary message that's important to walk away with tonight. And as city officials, I think it's our job to make sure that we make those connections and relay that information. And I'll just add one more thing, which is that tonight I know that one of the residents brought up the desire for a peninsula-wide emergency preparedness drill. And that's something that uh, Council Member Bradley and I have been talking about and working towards since our participation in the Peninsula Public Safety Committee. We're very, very close and we also have uh, the draft of a peninsula-wide public safety plan that really calls out the coordination that's required in, in, the, in times of, uh, of you know, great challenge. And so uh, I'm excited that over the duration of the last few years, we've come a lot closer as four cities to ensure that we're working contiguously across the whole peninsula together. That kind of brings me to my next question. This was a packed house tonight. How important is this and what are your plans to do more of these for your own residents? Yeah, this was a packed house, and I was really excited to see how many people came out. Um, the uh, turnout was much better than I had expected. So kudos to the supervisor's office as well as the sheriff's office for getting the word out. Uh, there are a couple of things that have happened recently on the peninsula, the tragedy up on Pear Tree Drive of those houses falling into the canyon. But I was really excited to hear uh, Supervisor Han, Han's commitment to helping us with our stabilization of the landslide, which could be orders of magnitude worse than what we saw in Rolling Hills Estate. My, house, my heart goes out to our residents in Rolling Hills Estates for the tragedy that it befell them, but I really hope we lean forward and prevent something from happening as opposed to reacting to it after it's happened. I, I love seeing these kinds of events where the public can actually connect directly with its government, interact, and talk through challenges, opportunities, and that's what we had tonight. And I felt like Sheriff Luna and Supervisor Han did a wonderful job of being very transparent about both and how we can uh, continue to move forward and, and work together. Uh, we've had public safety forums in the past in our city, not with the cachet that we had tonight, but I do think it's critical that we continue to offer opportunities for our residents to come out and engage with us. But even aside from that, I would encourage all those in our community to look at our website, look at one of our email addresses, 
send us an email. I know we're all very responsive to those emails when they're directed to us. And, or give us a phone call uh, in the city and uh, we'll get right back to you. And if it's not the, the right level of government that, and we don't have the answer to your question because it's something outside of uh, the, you know, municipal affairs, we will direct you to the right place. Uh, but start with the city. We, we can always get you to the right person. And, and know your zone. And know your zone. For, for me, after seeing this event and the, and the actual turnout, for me the biggest part is urgency, uh, especially with the landslide and the things that we keep on seeing in our community, like the crime rate and Portuguese Bend. So the biggest thing for me is solving the problems that we have now and putting our efforts to it as fast as we can to move the ball along because we don't want to end up in a position where we have houses going into the ocean. Yeah. I think not only that, but the fact that like there are so com many community members out here and they seem very receptive in RPV, at least to wanting to be involved and to help out. I think that's the most important part. The ap There's a lot of apathy, especially in our country now. And I'm thankful that we have a lot of community members who care about the place that they live in. And it helps us because it gives us a proper input. We need to make the right decisions for them and for our community now. I know you also see many of the residents come to your own city council meetings. Why do you think they care so much about this community? One of the, it's a beautiful place, first of all, but a lot of folks raise their children here. They have family members here. They want to grow old here. It's just a beautiful place, and I think just that in and of itself makes them care about where they live.